Hi, property people. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we will be sharing ideas, experiences, problems, and solutions for property people like you. Our interviews will get you to know some of the most active professionals in the industry that have achieved some pretty impressive stuff. Hearing about their successes, failures, strategies, and insights, we really hope you enjoy. Hi everybody, welcome to Property People. Today we are joined by Esgi Turk. Esgi uh, is an estate agent. She has, uh, she's an ex Foxton's estate agent, uh, which is where and when uh, I met her first. Um, she's also now the founder and managing director of April Properties, um, which is an estate agency based in East London and Leytonstone, uh, not too far from where I live as well. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Esgi. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Quite excited about the interview, to be honest. Never done one of these before. So. Happy days. I'm very pleased that um, you've, you've agreed to do this because I think you've got a really good uh, understanding of the property game, having been in it for such a long time, set up your own estate agency, um, as well as worked for one of the most famous or some might say infamous <laughs> estate agents uh, out there. But I think that, that that's really really important for people to be able to hear your story and and what you've been up to in property and how you go about doing your business but what i always like to start with is where it all began what i like to know is who are you at school is this something that when you were going to your classes that you were always thinking i can't wait to be an estate agent and own my own agency one day um definitely not never thought i'd become an estate agent to be honest with you uh it was always a thing kind of growing up Kind of, I'd always watch Homes Under the Hammer, love that show, um, kind of all of those other property shows where they'd find people homes abroad. And I always really, really enjoyed those, especially Homes Under the Hammer. So I always kind of from the age of probably like 12, 13, I started watching those, those shows. And it, it was, yeah, it was really, really interesting to me. I think the point where I found that I'd like to get into property was maybe kind of when I started university. Um, I didn't know much about it, but I always felt like, oh, the estate agents, they get to drive such nice cars, they have access to all these properties, and then I didn't realize how much work actually goes into the process, so it was, yeah, it was something, you just don't really know how it works until you actually do a job like this, I guess, which is, you know, something you could say about most jobs, um, but yeah. Absolutely. So in terms of when you were at school, um, I mean, to become an estate agent, did you go straight from like GCSEs, A levels? Did you do your A levels? Did you go straight into at what age did you start becoming an estate? Like becoming an estate? Oh, of course. Um, so I finished um, secondary school. I went to secondary school in Leytonstone, got my A to C's, my GCSEs. Then I went over to Leighton Sixth Form College, actually, which is local to us again, and did my A levels there. I always try and remember which ones I did. I did history, philosophy, and psychology. So all very, the... uh, they all sound pretty good to become an estate agent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the humanities, I always really, really enjoyed those types of subjects. And then I went to university, so I went to Greenwich and studied a BA there in history, which was always, oh, cool. it's always been my passion, that as well, along with being an estate agent. So, um, yeah, and then it, it just, you know, when you leave university, it's hard, it's hard to find a job, um, to be honest with you. I tried to get into curating for museums and things like that. It was a really competitive field that didn't work out. So I applied for my first estate agent job after university at Foxton's and I, I got it. And it was, yeah, a really exciting time. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, being a historian is not as glamorous as being an estate agent. You don't get to drive the flash car for certain. But, yeah, uh, you definitely was... not. So, so, okay. So you went into Foxton. So um, I think most people, especially if you live in London, definitely have heard of Foxton's. Uh, Foxton's um, are a London-based uh, estate agency. In terms of how you got the job there, was it through a recruitment agent? Did you apply directly? Why Foxton's out of all the agencies in London? Why did you decide to uh, join them? Um, I think, I mean, the whole recruitment process, I went, I just applied through their website. I had to actually submit a video 
um, to them. That was, wow. I don't know if they do that with everyone, but I had to submit a video. It's quite a long application process. Um, and then I got the call back, which I was extremely excited about because at that time I was working as an administrator at the NHS, uh, which was, it wasn't for me. It was quite boring. I'd just sit at my <laughs> desk and like have no contact with anyone, just like type up hundreds of letters a day. So it was really boring. So I got the phone call back. And I was yeah, extremely excited and went to my interview and, and got the job. Um, I think the reason why I applied for that, before, before that, when I was, you know, when I just finished university, because I, I still didn't kind of get into a job because, get into a state agent, I, because I didn't have a driver's license. So as soon as I got my license, I applied. And I remember right. walking around all the estate agents in Stratford and Leytonstone um, when I graduated and like handing out my CVs, but I never went into Foxton. Because I was really afraid with all the glass and the cafe style. Um, so I, I never walked in. But I went into everywhere else. Um, and then that was the first place I applied to uh, when I got my driver's license. So that's a real important thing when you're an estate agent. Obviously, so. Yeah, yeah. You need your estate. You need your driver's license to be able to. I used to actually think, because as you know, I started out as an estate agent. And I used to, um, my early days, consider myself like a glorified cab driver uh, because all I was doing, especially on a Saturday when there was loads and loads of viewings, I'd be picking up people, dropping them off and going around. Yeah. And I just try, but that's, that's actually part of the fun of it as well, I think. Uh, you get to Yeah, definitely. And drive around. You don't get stuck behind a desk all day like a boring historian. <laughs> exactly, exactly <laughs> that, but you know. <laughs> unless, unless you're Indiana Jones, is he, consider, is he, is he a historian? Um, I mean, he's... He's more of an adventurous historian, I guess you could call it. But yeah, questionable. <laughs> That's for a different podcast, I think. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we could go into that one later. <laughs> so, Foxons, um, the enigma that is Foxons. Let's shed a little bit of inside light on on what it's really like to work at Foxons. So, how 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 would you describe your days there? What would you describe? The, how would you describe the company? I mean, they've certainly got a reputation in the market. I, I love them and love them in equal measure because I think there's some mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant stuff about them uh, and there's some stuff, but I think that you can say that about a lot of companies. So what was, from, yeah. from the inside, what would you say that your, um, your perception of what was when you went in and how was it when you got on the inside? Absolutely. As, well, as soon as I started kind of working, I remember one of the questions they asked you at the interview was, how do you feel about working from eight to late? That was a question that they asked you quite openly. And I was like, absolutely, I love working. I do it all the time. I've done it before, don't worry. You know, I've been working since I was 14. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not work shy at all. Um, and I mean, yeah, so that was one of the questions. So you do work kind of, your morning meetings are, they start at 8.30, so you're expected to be at your desk at 8.30 in the morning. And, um, you know, you have a structure to your day. You're kind of making calls in the morning. I don't know if it's exactly the same now, but kind of just making loads of calls in the morning, getting through to as many people as you can, kind of afternoons, doing your viewings up until, you know, 8 p.m. I'd find myself sometimes if I, if I wanted to and if I needed to, I'd be out till 9 p.m. on viewing. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to show people, you know, some things which I felt like they'd definitely want to see and those were the only times I could get them in. So there's definitely Absolutely. a... Yeah, definitely a real competitive edge there. And they've, they've got a real good way of making you want to work and pushing you without pushing you. So, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah I, I personally had a really good time there. I, I learned a lot from, from it. Um, I learned, you know, it, it's a very um, professional company. It's, yeah. uh, you, you know, they have a great structure. They, you know, they're... they're you work very, very long hours. You don't have much of a social life. That's the reality. You are working yeah. kind of six days a week most of the time, especially if, in, you know, even if you want to do viewings on Sundays, I guess you can. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, I had a really good kind of manager there and I, I really, really enjoyed my time in the team. Well, I, I think um, mm. one of my, uh, the way I see Foxons is, as you say, they're incredibly professional. Um, every mm. single person that I come into contact with is really well spoken on the phone, really well dressed when they show up to the, the appointments, usually very punctual as well. And mm. I think that the caliber of people that they're picking up um, and, and hiring, it, 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 
it's set, I mean, apparently they say they've got really good training. Um, yeah, so they, definitely. So, um, but they also pick the really hard working people, the people that are literally, mm. as you say, willing to work from eight to eight. And, and you can see that because the amount of times I've tried to book viewings and they're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> They'll pretty much say to, yes to any time other than yeah. the times that they uh, are making the phone calls. When you're, when you're supposed to be doing phone calls, you're supposed to be in that in the office, but then kind of any time after six o'clock, it doesn't really matter too much. As long as the vendor doesn't mind, we'll be there. Exactly. Absolutely. That, 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 that's the way it was. So, yeah. But that's, I think also the reason why they get the results that they get, because they do the work that little bit harder than everybody else, the, the slightly longer hours. Yeah. And there's always a sacrifice. That's it. And I think in any industry, in any job that you want to do, if you do genuinely want to perform, kind of leaving Foxtons, I've, I've, I do, to be, to be honest, I feel like I personally have a better work-life balance. Um, I, and I don't really see myself kind of out till, you know, 8, 9 p.m. doing viewings. I might have some valuations or if, if we have to do some viewings at those times, we absolutely will. Um, but I don't see that happening because obviously, uh, you know, I'm managing it here. So I don't, you know, necessarily, I feel like there should be a healthier lifestyle kind of, you know, life work balance, um, which I try to instill at April. So, yeah. And I, I think actually from, from the managers that I've spoken to over the years, overall, their, their opinion was when, when I've had a similar conversation with them is that, you could probably get most of the work done in the kind of office hours, you know, mm. up until six, six, thirty-seven. You don't necessarily need to go, but with the Foxins, I think that they just breed this uber competitive internal office dynamic that it makes people go, you know what? Rather than yeah. it trickle over to the next day, I really want to get it done today. And and I think I, I'm not sure exactly how they get that out of people, but they've done a really good job of making people work that extra bit harder. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, in terms of working for Foxons and then deciding to set up your new agency, mm. um, so how, how did that whole journey come about? And actually, how long were you at Foxons overall? I was there for just under three years. Um, yeah, it was just under three years when I, when I left, yeah. Because actually, one other quick thing before we move on to your own agency, because we'll actually discuss mm. something along, is, is the pricing of Foxons. Mm. Um, they, they almost to the, to a certain extent pride themselves on their higher pricing in the marketplace. So for example, the average, uh, fee for, uh, I think across London is, is 1.5% plus VAT to sell a property. Mm -hmm. That's the average. Yeah. You can go below and above, but there's, they just stick at 2.5 and they do not budge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's true. They, I mean, from, if, if it's still the same, from when I was there, it was 2.5% uh, plus VAT for their sales services. Um, and I think if you were to go multi-agency, there were 3% plus VAT. Um, yeah. I, I felt kind of working there and being there, you know, they, they instill a real pride of working in such an environment and they make you feel proud to work um, for Foxtons, I remember I had a branded mini, for example, one Sunday I was coming out of my car and then some uh, lady just started shouting down uh, the street saying, oh, don't use Foxtons, they'll rip you off and just started <laughs> shouting. I was extremely embarrassed and I, I, I didn't understand why she was behaving in such a way. Obviously, I, I would never do such a thing, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, she was just like just shouting down the road. I was just thinking, oh, what, what's wrong with Foxes? I mean, they're great. We're, we work so, so hard, you know, and I definitely felt that we worked a lot harder than our competitors out there because we, a lot of the time, yes, we did used to probably beat them in price and things like that and were able to get, just get more people through the door because we just didn't rely on inquiries alone. Um, we used to pick up the phone and speak to people and do it in the old fashioned way. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just building relationships and talking to people. Um, so, but yeah, it was, um, I mean, they have those fees, they don't negotiate and it works. I guess they're doing something right. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> they're, actually still one of the, <laughs> they're still around, they're still doing well. And you know, yeah. it's actually one of the analogies that I, I don't know if you follow football much, but Man United, right. So for 20 years or so, they were kind of the best team in the world. And, Mm. And then um, 
every whenever they lost, everybody was like celebrating because they were kind of like they were the best, <laughs> but everybody kind of hated them because they were the best and they were just yeah. everywhere in everyone's face. And I think boxings they they do charge that little bit more, but like you said, they do work that bit more, um, mm. and and they justify their price in that way. And I think it's like every marketplace you've got certain people that are you know going to charge more and say that you get more and there's more value from it, and some people will go for it. I know a landlord that uses Foxins. Um, and again, the lettings fees are a lot more than the average uh, mm. on, on the high street and, yeah. and, and they're happy to pay it. And I mean, from, from my personal point of view, having known this side of the industry somewhat from in the inside, I, I don't feel comfortable paying that extra. But what I always do say is that I'll always buy or rent a place from Fox and using their, you know, their, their team, yeah. because I think it's a pleasure working with them because they are uber professional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I completely get it. And, you know, for a lot of people, that was the issue if they were not, you know, if they were not going to instruct um, boxers, it was usually purely down to the fees. Otherwise, I'm sure if the fees were like 1%, 1.5%. I would have used them all day. Yeah, they'd absolutely go for it. They know the ethos, they know the way they work, and they do solely work for their clients, which I'm also... A believer in till this day working for your yeah. client um you know and and having their best interests at heart obviously making sure that the process is um fair for everyone involved and everything's transparent and open and you know kind of in my day we never used any kind of you know there was this such a reputation about toxins which when i got there i genuinely didn't understand because like, oh, they'll cheat, they'll lie, they'll do this. But I just thought, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel that. I didn't get that from my manager. I didn't feel any pressure, you know, who's, to, to, to behave in such a way. Um, and, you know, and the trading was amazing. And, you know, making sure yeah. that you don't take gifts and things like that. And from, <laughs> from buyers <laughs> and, you know, no, no bribes, of course not. And, you know. But you didn't. I, I you didn't accept thought. my brown. You didn't accept, uh, accept my brown paper envelope. <laughs> no, I, I didn't accept it because you didn't give me one. So, um, <laughs> but no, no, absolutely not. So there was nothing like that when I was there. So I never saw any of that. I never, and I didn't get it. I just felt like we're just a hard working. Well, most of us are a hard working bunch of people that <laughs> that actually just wanted to make something of us, other than you know, grow in the company and and be better. Um, but, which yeah. makes complete sense. I think it's good to debunk some myths every now and then. And yeah, uh, I, I mean, are, are you, uh, do you keep in touch with any of the, the crew there? Are there any people there from when you were there still there? And because I've um, heard also they have a high turnover of us, you know, they've got their core team. And then, of course, I was, I was in the Stratford office. Um, our turnover was not that high because we had such a great manager because right. our team was quite, you know, we had a really good team. So we didn't have that much of a high turnover compared to some of the other offices like Canary Wharf or so. Um, so, no, I mean, there's, you know, I made a really, really, really great friend at Fox and, you know, she's one of my best friends at the moment, at the moment. <laughs> for now. <laughs> for now. Um, no, no, she's, for now, no, no. She's, she's, Do you want to give her, is she an estate agent still? Um, no, she's not. Um, she was, and then she actually worked with me for a few months, and then at April, and then decided it wasn't the career for her any longer. Right. And she wanted to kind of go off, and she moved, you know, outside of London and, and changed her whole life for the better. Um, yeah. But yeah, she's she's one of my best friends. I met her there, and you know, that was another great thing that, that came out of Foxes was meeting such a great friend, and you know. Um, hmm. Well, working at Foxins has certainly been inspiring to you because not only did you do well there, but you also went on to set up your own agency, which is no tiny feat by any stretch of the imagination. I've run the numbers on, on starting an agency a few times and trying to break the mold because there's some agents on high streets that have been around for absolutely ages. that have yeah. got some really good relationships with all the families that they've sold to already. And mm -hmm. To break in these days, especially with all the marketing costs from Right Move and Zoopla and cars yeah. and this, that, and the other, it's not an easy um, thing to take on. But if you can crack it, it's a thoroughly enjoyable uh, career yeah. and business to, to 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 work in. So, tell us a little bit about how that came into your mind. Is it something that you always wanted to to start an agency, or did it come about kind of accidentally and you just grabbed it with both hands? Yeah, I think 
the point where I wanted to become an estate agent, I always, I always knew that I wanted to have my own business at some point in my life. Ever since I was young, I always wanted to have that, that, uh, that freedom, that financial freedom as well that came with kind of um, having your own business. It's a lot more hard work, believe me. I'd rather, sometimes I think, oh, so I should have just stuck to my job and <laughs> I should have just, you know, I'd just love to be getting a salary right now and have a car which is paid for. I don't have to pay for fuel, don't have <laughs> overheads, I don't need to worry about what's happening, I don't need to manage tenancies. But then I just, it, it's just so much, it's just amazing for me, especially kind of with my parents. They came over from Turkey. I was born in London and we're the first generation, you know, first generation that's gone to university here trying to build a, a, gen, a genuinely better life and I always knew that I wanted I wanted to make something of myself and you know make my family proud and being the eldest child out of three I always had this pressure on me that yeah. I have to be an example to my siblings I have to set an, a good example I have to go to university I have to get a good job or good job estate agent some some <laughs> might not see that as being a great job but for me it was um and, you know, setting up my own business and trying to create a, a positive legacy that I can leave behind for my children and their children. And that's, and that's the kind of the aim of everything. We, we kind of growing up never had, never had much at all. Kind of grew up in a one bedroom flat in Leytonstone, five of us, um, up until I was like 14 moved to Stratford, like then shared a room with my sister. And, you know, it was, you know, it was tough growing up. And I realized that, property as well I think I've always had a an attachment to it kind of realizing that it, it gives you freedom kind of having a nice house living in a home that that you like or you know, it, it's just so so important to me so I, I always wanted to get into something like that and then when the opportunity came up my uncle my dear uncle uh, who I love very much he's a <laughs> lawyer he has his own law firm um, he you know, spoke to me one, one evening and said, what do you think about starting your own agency? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Let's go for it. Why not? I said, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I literally said to him, why not? I said, absolutely. If I'm putting all these hours into something else, I'm putting like 12, 13 hours a day, why not kind of work towards something which is going to create a long-term legacy and I can kind of grow it with, with my ethics and my ethos of what I'd like to to see kind of a successful agency being um and yeah so he asked me and I said absolutely and then we have so there's two business partners um so my uncle and uh, Jamal and my um and another business partner Donna they're both lawyers um and then it's me who runs the whole operation um yeah, so it's just a really and how did, interesting time. And how did the name April Properties, where did that come from? That actually, um, that was my uncle Jamal's idea. He, he kind of came up with April and I thought, I honestly, I, instantly I felt this is an amazing name. I, I, I just was like, <laughs> oh great, April, like a new beginning. It's like Easter time, people are wanting to move home during, you know, during that period. It, it's spring it's yeah. yeah it's a new awakening i quite yeah kind of that that's the way we see it. it's not because we officially opened or started trading in april as some people say <laughs> oh i thought it was because um, i was born in april that's the reason why you used oh yeah name. definitely oh absolutely <laughs> sam yeah yeah april was, the six was, you should have called it <laughs> exactly that that's exactly why we did it <laughs> okay so um i mean that's amazing i always take my hat off to anybody that can um have the courage to start their own business because it's no easy uh, task and there's and there's a big difference between working in a business and then working on the business and Absolutely. when you make that transition it's hard to be able to differentiate between the two but um yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a lonely journey but it's a very rewarding journey as well at times so Absolutely. um why Leytonstone why why I mean you mentioned actually you're from Leytonstone right yeah, so I was actually born in Whips Cross Hospital down the road. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then, yeah, I grew up on Lancaster Road. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, you know, went to school in the area. I, I know it really well. Um, so, and then this place came up basically. Um, so, 
saw it online and was like, oh my gosh, I remember this shop. We used to go, it used to be a news agent. Um, wow. We used to pop in for sweets and things, you know, <laughs> after school. I was like, this would be amazing to actually try and pick up. And luckily, um, the shop site itself um, had been empty for quite some time. And, and the landlord, I think, because it needed so much work, they were struggling to shift it. Um, but, you know, I've always been up for a project. It was something which, as soon as I saw it, I could see the potential in it. It hadn't been touched in probably about 50, 60 years. So I just thought, absolutely, walked straight in and was like, yeah, we'll take it. It's great. <laughs> We're starting right here. <laughs> yeah, I, literally, I was like, yeah, this is, this is absolutely perfect. The location is great. It's on the high road. Um, it, it's really accessible. You know, parking is great which is, you know, something really important to yeah, estate agents. Estate agency. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need parking. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. It worked out. So in terms of yes. um, the activities of, a, of an agent, it's normally sales, lettings, property management. Do you do all of the above? Yes, we do. Yeah, we've even branched out into commercial lettings. Oh, wow, um, amazing. Yeah, so we, we completed on our first, commercial transaction about uh what now six weeks ago um Congrats. in hackney so that was that was amazing that was a new one for me as well so uh, phenomenal that's really cool yeah and so in terms of um proportion though at the moment i mean well, at the moment in the last eight weeks it's probably been a yeah. little bit uh kind of fudging the numbers a bit but in terms of generally um proportion of sales and lettings would you consider yourself more of a sales agent or more because i know some some agencies as you know are kind of just we only do lettings and some of them are like well we yeah. do sales but we do a little bit of lettings or i mean do you do you see yourself more as one or the other honestly no um it be 50 50 for sales and letting um yeah. i i literally couldn't say one is more than the other because like viewing numbers wise, I mean, over the last, let's say over the last kind of six, seven weeks, it has been predominantly rental, um, yeah. rentals that we've been dealing with. Um, however, over the last two weeks, sales has soared extremely. So um, yeah, definitely would say 50 50. Do you prefer one or the other? I mean, do you have a preference? If you, if you had to, if yeah. somebody told you that you could only do sales or lettings, the government is shutting you down from one of the departments, <laughs> as, which one would um, you choose? Could you choose between the two babies? <laughs> it, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I can tell you what I like about both. So yeah, m my origins were sales. <laughs> so that's, you know, I'd never done lettings before I opened this company. Um, and I learned pretty much by myself. I literally had no help. So I just learned the whole process of how it worked, how property management works um, myself and, and just got into it. And I really, the one thing I really like about the sales side of things is building really like long-term relationships with the people you meet. Um, that's something yeah. I, I love. And I love meeting new people and I love communicating with people. The, the, the thing with lettings is it's very fast paced. I can meet someone today and have them moved in tomorrow, you know, if, yeah, if things yeah, yeah, went yeah. well. So there's no, there's no time sometimes to build relationships in that sense. So I love the relationship building side of sales and, you know, communicating with people. And, but then I also love financially the, the, the letting side of things and management because it is so much quicker. I mean, as you know, you have, you have um, sales which could be going on for three, four, five, six months. And then, you yeah. know, on the day of exchange, it could all pretty much fall through. Um, which happens, which happens. Which, uh, which happens, you know, not that much, but it, it still happens. And it, it, it can be so, so heartbreaking. And, you know, as an estate agent where you just, where you're like, please don't withdraw. Please don't buy the property, please. <laughs> You know, it's just you, six months. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. We haven't come all this uh, way for nothing, hopefully. Please, come on. <laughs> um, in terms of the um, fall through rate, I remember there was a statistic, this was kind of mid 2000s. Uh, mm. I don't know if it's still, but they said one in three sales fall through. 
have you do you know what your kind of uh, rate is of fall throughs is it is it somewhere in line with the national average i'd say ours is a lot less than that i mean now i don't have mass amounts of data to actually go through um because we haven't been operating for so that long but i definitely say it would be lower i'd say i mean probably you know less than one in three i'd probably say you know maybe like one in four one in five fall through because it is heartbreaking when that when they do yeah. fall through as you say you've always been working and there's always a chance that you can piece it back together or sell it to somebody else but you've worked so hard yeah. to get it to that point and then the emotions start going all over the place. But I mean, that, that's true though. So lettings is so much better because it's just, it's a quicker turn. It's uh, quicker, yeah. easier to, to get the wheels in motion for that kind of um, operation. And then, um, and, you're, and you're managing properties as well. Are you doing kind of uh, full-time management? Yes, for, for we landlords? do. Yeah, full-time property management. Um, so most of the management side of things um, I, I'm fully responsible for. Uh, which I, I actually quite enjoy property management. I like I like kind of going back and forward to people. It, it's also new. I mean, not not new new to me, but it was you know quite new to me when I first started two years ago. Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's enjoyable. It's an enjoyable thing, and I think I mean over the last eight weeks, I've barely had anything to deal with in management. No tenants have been contacting us. Um, I hope I hope that's not a bad thing, but um, I think but only kind of urgent repairs we're able to go out at the moment due to COVID. I find, I find um, the majority of the calls come in from tenants normally coming into winter when they're firing up their boilers and they're not working because they've... Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. But there, there are loads of times where, oh, my heating's not working. Have you checked the meter? Have you topped it up? <laughs> Can you switch the boiler up? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it's working now. Great. Um, that old chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, you get you get loads of those. But it, it's okay. You know, things you can deal with in five minutes over so. In terms of um, in terms of myths, uh, we're talking about. So, I mean, it's because estate agents. Once upon a time, again, uh, this reminded me of many of my old days, but. Um, I remember, you know, we were, I think, the second most hated profession in the country behind traffic wardens. <laughs> that was that was the thing, I think, I, around I 2005. Believe, <laughs> I can believe that. Yeah, I, I can absolutely believe that. And, uh, yeah. and actually, for estate agents, I think the most hated profession is traffic wardens because they keep giving us parking tickets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's exactly the way it works. And I think, I mean, saying that and kind of estate agents is kind of when I had a look at I forgot where I, where I saw this, but it was an article online that I was reading about the most stressful jobs. Right. And, you know, that you can have an estate agent were in the top 10. So it, first, I believe it was solicitors. They had like bus drivers and estate agents. <laughs> but so we were up there as well in the stress. <laughs> it de- it, I mean, it's definitely not an easy job. I'll, I'll vouch no. for that. But in, in terms definitely. of uh, myths, though, right now, because it, this affects the whole country. So whether you're property investors, I mean, I get asked this question so many times, mm. um, the last eight weeks, especially. Are you are we able to get discounts on properties now that COVID-19 has kicked in? Is everybody, you know, selling at 20 percent below what they were selling at yesterday? Is that is that something because you're at the you're at the right at the coal face right now? Absolutely. Um, what, what's, what's your take on that? Um, no. Yeah. No, we, we can't get discounts on things. You know, they're not our properties. Firstly, they're not our properties to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have control over what a vendor will or will not accept. You know, we, we can put forward offers to them for them to consider. But apart from that, there's nothing else we can do unless, you know, you own the property, Sam, or I own the property. And we, we, if we'd be willing to take a 20% discount, which I definitely wouldn't at this time, you know, um, I think so, yeah. I think that that's I think that that's where the mis- misperception is a misconception. Mm. It's it's that um, just because the economy is struggling, that means that everybody's going to the, the market automatically corrects itself and everybody drops mm. their price. But what it actually boils down to is the circumstances mm. of the owner. And if the owner thinks that they're going to get have to accept twenty percent less than what they would have got yesterday, and they don't yeah. have to move, they're probably just not going to move. Exactly. That 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 that's not gonna the sell. situation. It's purely down to the uh, circumstance that that 
of the individual cases. I mean, if if someone's going through a separation and they're absolutely desperate to just completely get rid of the property, but then both parties having to agree to it, which is also another issue <laughs> that yeah. you face. Um, I don't know, people in debt, um, if they're being repossessed, those types, of, those types of situations, as you know, in the type of job you do as well, they don't come up, up that often. And um, not in London, not in London yeah. so much, because, I mean, people generally have, you know, got quite financially stable overall if they've owned a property in London for the last five to 10 years because they'll have exactly. had some capital growth in it. And they, they feel relatively comfortable. I mean, just to get on the property ladder in the first place, they would mm -hmm. have had to have some decent income. So I think, I mean, it's, it's funny because I've got one friend of mine and she's buying a property and, you know, she's trying, you know, where, where she's like, the asking price is at 350. What should I be offering? Should I be buying now? Should I be waiting six months? I mean, what do you tell people if, if you get that kind of question? I mean, are we talking about now? What I'd advise people? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, okay. she, I mean, she, she's telling me, Sam, I've got this property. It's 350 You know, should I wait six months? Should I, what should I offer on it? Um, okay. What would you say to somebody like that today? I'd say, I'd explain to them. I'd say, if they were to rent that property, how much would they be paying in rent? That 350,000 property, and how much would they be paying versus kind of on a mortgage if it's a tracker or a fixed rate? I'd compare both of those and I'd kind of look at general trends. Um, I mean, I saw a statistic that after World War II, house prices in London have doubled every 10 years. So my thought process is always okay, so if you buy this property today, you offer 350,000 and you sell in five years time or six years time, or you just rent it out after a few years and you know, buy something else. At the end of the day, you're gonna need somewhere to live. And if the monthly cost of you owning your own property, having security and not having a landlord give you a notice to vacate, I'd always prefer the ownership side of things yeah. um, if I have the deposit available. That, that's just, the logic of it because I know monthly that mortgage is probably going to be 25 30 percent you know most of the time less than what I'd be paying in London rent for example so it, it's a, something you have to take you know with a bit of kind of you know looking into the future and knowing that if you're going to be selling in a few years if you're buying purely for investment if you're buying um, are you going to be able to rent the property out? Are you going to be living in the property? You know, are you, would there be an option for you to maybe sell the property? What I always look at when people are buying is the, how easy would it be to sell that property if I was stuck in a few yeah. years time? So kind of looking at things that are mortgageable, for example, yeah. you know, things like that. So if you did get yourself into a bit of difficulty, it's not going to be something that's going to be difficult for you to sell. But most people won't. They might hold on to it. Maybe if the values go up, refinance, you know, and buy so somewhere else. I think you're right. I mean, that makes complete sense. It's, it depends on the end goal, the individual circumstance, and also being able to feel comfortable that the property that you're buying will either sell quickly but if you need mm -hmm. to or need it to or it'll rent quickly so you can exactly. and you know that rental income will cover the mortgage costs so exactly. you're basically not risking yourself and exposing yourself and the thing is you're again i agree with you if you've got you know 10 20 percent deposit to put down on a mm -hmm. three hundred fifty thousand pound type place then you know that cash sitting in the bank if you invest it in a place like london you're probably going to get some capital growth over the next um, over the next 10, 15, 20 years if you look at it from a long-term perspective. Exactly. And that's probably a, the, you know, a safe way to look at it, I guess. No. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think absolutely. I mean, since kind of we've been able to do viewings again and, and the markets have kind of reopened for, for kind of property activity, um, I've found that so many buyers are inquiring on things. I've agreed, for example, on Saturday, two offers um, at oh, asking wow. price. Absolutely. So, you know, but <laughs> the thing is people, people are out there and they're extremely keen to get something tied up and, and they want to because 
I mean, the reality is the rental market in the United Kingdom, the population growth, especially in London, exactly. I, I, and the supply and demand, you know, it's difficult being a tenant in London. It, it is hard. It's expensive and it's difficult. Yeah. You don't know if the landlord's going to sell. You don't know. You don't really know what they'll no do. Security. So it, there's no security. Um, of course, you have your assured short hold tenancies, but you know, if it's like a 12 month tenancy sign, then you might find yourself looking for another place in 10 months um, yeah, yeah. to move again. So it's, it, it's, you know, if you've got that deposit to hand, it's not making any money, as you said, in the bank. So um, can I, can I ask very quickly those two that you offered you got accepted? Are they houses or flats? Um, so one of them is a three bedroom flat in Leytonstone. It's in a Victorian property. Um, it's yeah. over two floors. It's, it's stunning. Um, that's, yeah, that's in Leytonstone. And then we've got another house, a three bedroom house in Forest Gates, um, which is beautiful, has lovely period features. Um, and, and that's one as well. And so these three bed flat, three bed house sound, are these are quite large units. Are these for families? So the one in Leytonstone, it's two cousins. Um, they're buying the property. They 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 viewed it and, and and they literally said to me, I mean, what's the catch here? <laughs> what's the catch? <laughs> I said honestly, there's no catch because <laughs> I think compared to some other things that that they've been seeing maybe in Bow um, yeah. and, and towards Hackney. I mean, you, you nowhere if if you put that property to Leytonstone in. Hackney or Bow, where they're at, I mean, 500, 550. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that for them, it's amazing value. And, you know, we do have, we still have great value properties um, in and around kind of East London and all over. If, if, you're, if you're looking for them, they're definitely there. And, and things which you could, I mean, happily, I'd, I'd live in any of those. I mean, both of those properties. No I think issue. East London's got huge uh, value, always has done. And Definitely. I think uh, Forest Gate, you mentioned, that's on the cross rail. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that that's yeah. got massive growth um, as soon as the cross rail kicks in, which I'm not sure when that will be. I don't think anybody does. But... <laughs> they say now 2021. I think even when, when we were speaking, <laughs> Sam, you know, years ago, <laughs> it was coming in. <laughs> it was oh, coming in the next that. three months. <laughs> don't worry, it'll, it'll be in in three, four months, you know. We, we... You have to get to Canary Wharf in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's still so, a great area. I mean, you're right next to Wanstead yeah. Flats and um, it, it is a beautiful area and you, get, and you, get, you do get good value. So, um, Absolutely. In Leytonstone, just for anybody that doesn't know the area well, is it, um, do you find that you're getting more young professionals or is it more families? Is it a mixed type area? You know, what, 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 yeah. What? I mean, a lot of the a lot of the people that I'm dealing with in Leytonstone, um, you know, young professionals buying, renting, you know, buying yeah. their first homes, or you do have a lot of people upsizing in the area right. or upsizing if they've owned a house in Forest Gate or a flat, they're wanting to move to Leytonstone, Wanstead, yeah. um, this, you know, the E11 region, because we have great schools in the area for families. Um, you know, quite a few offset outstanding um, schools. It's, it's a real nice community feel. And, it, and, you know, compared to when I was growing up in the area, it definitely did not feel like this at all. It was not, it didn't feel this, um, you know, it, it's definitely gentrified. That's all I can say. <laughs> when, I was, when I was growing up, yeah. And no, you know, I, I mean, I've been in, the, in and around East London for 20 years and everywhere but from Wanstead through to Leighton and Leighton Stone, that whole yeah. little strip has, uh, has been transformed and gentrified, which is a good thing. You know, some yeah. people actually really don't like developers that come in and capitalize mm. on an area that's not, but, you know, areas like Hackney Wick and, and around East London, all around East London from the Olympic Village. Um, have really benefited from some sort of gentrification because these were high crime rate areas and now they're desirable for young families and good schools. And I think yeah. that's only a positive. So, and then agencies like yourself uh, open up, which is adds more to the, uh, to the beauty of an area, I would say. Yeah. Um, in terms of, in t I, this is a, I mean, in terms of the impact, because there's been some legislative changes with regards to rentals, 
um, mm. where they banned the tenant fees. Um, and they were saying that that was going to affect estate agents, especially that had large um, dependency on income from rental market. What's been your, how has that affected you? Has that been, had a massive impact? Has that been difficult to navigate? I mean, for us, um, I can't say there's been a huge impact purely because of the fact that you know we never benefited from tenant fees for a decade you know we probably benefited from them for about what six to eight months and then the ban came into effect right, so right. we didn't we, we weren't able to necessarily capitalize on that um but kind of even when i was kind of um had referencing fees and things like that i i never wanted to overcharge tenants either for such services yeah. Um, so we'd always try to keep them at a, a reasonable rate, which we thought compared to some other agents, um, you know, were, were a bit more reasonable for people. And we, 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 I've never kept any tenants kind of holding deposits or anything like that. I don't want to kind of practice in kind of bad faith with, with people. So, you know, I've, I've never wanted to do that. But it has not, no, it's definitely not affected us massively because we weren't capitalizing on, on it in the first place for, for a long period of time but i know it, yeah funnily enough uh foxons that were famous for having crazy high i mean what were they mm. like 250 pounds per person right i think uh, when it got announced that the tenant fee ban was coming into effect mm. they upped their fees to try and make as much money i think as right. they could before the fee came into effect because before i believe it was 450 pounds for as many people moving in, it didn't matter. Um, but then, you know, it went up to 250 per person, up to four, four. So it was maximum a thousand pound for referencing. Wow. But people then were still paying, paying the service, paying the fees. I mean, you yeah. know, don't hate the player, <laughs> hate the game. You know, exactly. I mean, you can't. I mean, look, I mean, you can't. I mean, what can you say? I mean, that that's the way they run their business, and you know. I, I guess once again, it's the demand. This is where it's demand. It, it, exactly. If the tenants weren't there, if they didn't need to rent, if that, that property was happening. available elsewhere, you know, the, the, you know, the, they would have gone somewhere exactly. else. That's cheaper. But Fox exactly. and they're getting the listing, and, and that's what they charge. So, so exactly. I mean, that's good. It's good that you've uh, been able to. I mean being an estate agent the market does yeah. go up and down and round and round and you need to be able to be agile enough to to get through these times mm. um and and the same way um sellers and landlords need to be able to to give themselves the best possible chance of getting that tenant and securing that buyer um is there any tips that you can give to landlords or sellers vendors to prepare their property in the best possible way um, to get, I mean, one of the famous ones is like, you know, bake a bit of bread in the morning and have that later. <laughs> uh, is there something like that that uh, you, uh, I mean, what would you, cause, I mean, I'm assuming that having a messy house is not a good way to start a viewing. Of course. I think, I mean, most people will know this anyway, but it, it's good to always kind of remind people, but decluttering. Um, showing the space in its best possible way by not having so much clutter around, making sure if you've got kids, the kids' toys are packed away. Because, I mean, for someone like me, I, I can see past all of that, but some people genuinely can't, which is not a bad thing either. So we don't want to kind of, um, kind of ruin our chances with people who would usually go for things that just, you know, because that date was untidy or, yeah, I don't yeah, know, if yeah. something was happening, they didn't want to go through it. I definitely recommend decluttering. Um, you know, I think, you know, having a fresh coat of paint, trying to, sometimes if it's a rental, trying to keep it as neutral as possible. Um, you know, white walls, you know, grey carpets, um, you know, not necessarily that it has to be fully refurbished beforehand, but those types of things really, ensuring the place is clean, um, just instills a bit more, you know, especially with tenants, instills a bit more confidence when they're taking properties um, that the landlords actually take care of the, the property so they feel a bit more comfortable to sign up maybe to longer term tenancy if the yeah, properties yeah. are in good order. Um, for, for sellers, I mean, one of the big things that I've realized working in this industry, um, I find that a lot of people renovating properties 
um, I always I always encourage them to retain as much of the period features as they can. A yeah. lot of people don't know this, but the buyers that we have out there really love the period features. For some people, having a chimney breast is is annoying because it's not a straight wall. But for a lot of people, it's nice yeah. so they can put a fireplace back in. And you know, if the coving's up there, some people absolutely rip it all out and just have a clean you know, white box, but you know, a lot of the buyers that we're selling to love the period features. So definitely sellers, if, if you've got them there, definitely keep them. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I know. I, especially in and around London, the period features are a mm. huge selling point. Um, uh, and the more authentic, the better. Um, and in terms of things like photos and floor plans, so how important are professional photos and professional floor plans to help you do your job best and get inquiries? They are extremely important. I mean, when I first got into this, I, I didn't know the cost of professional photography floor plans. And then when I started doing the numbers, I realized that it's a big expense, but it's something that we can't not do because I don't I mean I just don't want to be the agent who does it on my phone if it's going to be you know if it's a beautiful property I don't, I don't feel like I could do it justice on my phone yeah. um I don't feel like I could do it justice with a camera by myself so I feel like I'd, I'd rather pay a professional we obviously don't charge any of our clients for this service but I pay a professional you know they go in work with a really great company you know, they take the, the floor plans, do the professional photography, and we do that for all of our properties. Um, it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter the condition. We always want to kind of put the marketing. And, and it does make a difference, especially if, if it's going online. Um, you, want it, you want things to look the best they can. And photos are so, so important, especially in this day and age with digital marketing and everyone's online. They're, they're seeing so many options. So if your photos don't look great, it's... It, you know, it's highly likely that they might not click on your ad and, and they wouldn't want further information, although it might be the perfect property for them. But yeah. if the photos don't look great, that, that they're completely going to ignore it, you know? Yeah, and then happens. they're not going to make the inquiry and without the inquiry, you'll never have a chance of getting it let us you know, sold and that's, that's exactly. a big issue. So in terms of uh, the future of April properties, um, is it something that you're, uh, you're happy, you know, with having a really strong independent, almost like a Harrods, you know, you just got one location and you want to, you want to knuckle down or do you have aspirations to, to spread across London, uh, like Foxton's? Have you thought that far into the future yet? I have. I mean, when I first started this place, I, I, I want, I want to be independent. I don't want to be a corporate company. I don't want to. I don't kind of want to have that feel. I want us to be independent. I want us to be local. I mean, for yeah. me, starting in Leytonstone was perfect because I am a local. I think I that's great, in, by the way. You know, I've grown up in the area. I know the area. Um, you know, your local estate agent. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, here. Literally. So, um, but I would like to open, you know, open a few more branches. I think that's in the future. I don't think I'll be doing that, you know, in the next kind of few months or anything like that. But I, I would like to, I, I definitely would. And, you know, I would lo love to grow my team and, you know, get a few more people on board um, and, yeah, and, and just run a successful company, I guess. And, you know, something which, which you know, changes the reputation of estate agents and where people feel, you know, I, I actually, I think I've changed my mind. So I think they're actually okay. They're not that bad. <laughs> Honestly, that's a, that's a similar mindset that, that I had when I was an estate agent. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to change the perception of estate agents. I'm going to be a good, responsible, accountable one. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I know that you are, which is amazing. So, Ezgi, we have run out of time on, on this occasion, but I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you, getting to know a little bit more about your business and your background. And I'm hoping that um, we're going to be able to do this again post COVID-19 in the next six, 12 uh, months, see how you're getting on. Um, but thank you again for, for sharing okay. your time with us. Before no, you go, welcome. before you go, if people wanted to reach out to you and get hold of you, what's the best way that they can uh, reach out? Of course. I mean, you can, you can email me. I mean, you can give our office a call if you like, 0208-257-2100. Or you could um, drop me an email. It's esgi at aprilproperties.co.uk. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out. We're also on Instagram um, at aprilproperties if you'd like to connect with us there. Yes. 
definitely follow the Insta. I follow the Insta. Thanks again, yeah. Ezgi. Thank You're you a star. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got lots more super active property people coming up. So keep up to date. Click the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Leave us a comment. Share us and find us across social media. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.